Hello and welcome to today's Cybersecurity Summit Power Hour. My name is Rick. I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please submit a question using the Q&A panel. During the presentation, all participants will remain in listen-only mode. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded for rebroadcast. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of each of today's presentations. We encourage you to submit written questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of your screen. Please type your questions into the text field and hit send. Please keep the drop down as all panelists. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Bradford Graham, CEO of the Cybersecurity Summit. Bradford, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Rick. And uh, thank all of you for, uh, for joining us. This is our final Power Hour uh, dedicated to our West Coast uh, listeners and subscribers. Uh, we do wish we could come to you in person and perhaps in 2021, we will, coming back, uh, we will come back to uh, Silicon Valley and the Los Angeles region for our live cybersecurity summits. Uh, pending uh, the health of our country. But until that time, we're going to be continuing um, with our cybersecurity summits on a virtual basis. And as a matter of fact, on July 28th, uh, pretty much for the Southeast region, but you are welcome to join, uh, we are going to be hosting our first cybersecurity summit. Um, it'll be an official summit with over 30 top speakers from the FBI, the DHS, the Secret Service, uh, companies like Darktrace uh, and many others. So we invite you to join us. The details are on cybersummitusa.com. Also, for those people that actually have an active security clearance, our sister company, Tech Expo, we will be hosting a, uh, a hiring event, a job fair, virtually, of course, and that is going to be on the 23rd with uh, 20 top companies uh, such as Lockheed, Mar Lockheed Martin, uh, CA CACI, uh, AT&T, and many others. So if you've got a top secret security clearance, please join us. Uh, details about that are on techexpousa.com. Uh, with regards to today, we've got a great lineup of speakers from the FBI, Google, uh, Duo Security, and the DHS uh, slash CISA. And we're going to begin that right now. We're going to bring on uh, Enrique Alvarez. He's been with the FBI for over 18 years. And if you decide to join us for the entire presentation, you'll also be getting a CPE credit in a few days. Enrique, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Brad. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Enrique Al. All right, next we are going to uh, tee up Google and let's get Cyrus on the, uh, on the line there and let's switch over to Cyrus from Google. He's been there for many, many years. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today to learn more about securing remote workers during this challenging time. My name is Cyrus Mystery, and I'm the Group Product Manager for Chrome Enterprise. In today's session, we're going to start out by talking about the current landscape and how remote working has created new security challenges for IT. We're going to discuss what IT needs in order to create a full stack solution, and we will cover Google's product offerings in this area. Please feel free to ask questions in our live Q&A module, and please remember to fill out the session survey at the end of the presentation. We would love to get your feedback. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. COVID-19 has required organizations to embrace remote working just to keep the lights on. In fact, on March 17th, Gartner ran a study with 800 HR executives to ask about how COVID has impacted their business. They found that 88% of organizations have asked their employees to work remotely. 97% have canceled work-related travel. But most interestingly, only 10% of the organizations plan to reduce work hours. So basically, despite the prevalence of coronavirus, business demands are requiring that work must go on. At the same time that all of that transition is happening, which is enormous in itself, cyber criminals are getting emboldened by this. They're de deploying all kinds of new attacks to take advantage of business users. This has created 
a really, really challenging environment for IT. They are trying to protect corporate data without having physical access to the device, to the user, or to the network. In fact, Gartner reported a new type of attack variant targeting business users with fake coronavirus-related emails. And they're phishing attacks, right, designed to trick employees into opening attachments. And interestingly, when the user opens these attachments, there's malicious software that can infect the end user device. These have the potential to cause a lot of damage, and we're already starting to see this. This is only one example of what's happening. And the third very interesting thing that's going on at this time, so you've got, we've got to move to remote work. We've got this new type of security challenge that we're facing with new types of threats at the same time. And IT departments are being asked to cut costs, right? Which is remarkable set of things that they have to deal with. And this is across the board. This is because almost every business is facing some type of economic impact from this shutdown. In fact, you can actually see the quote here, right? 70% of organizations are planning to cut costs. But what's interesting is they're planning to cut costs through more effective use of technology. And I think that's where we can come in and help. So what do we mean by full stack approach? Secure remote working requires a full stack approach. It requires thinking about secure endpoints, right? Which, and we're going to cover each of these, by the way. Secure endpoints to harden devices to reduce or almost completely eliminate the risk of malware. User protections to make sure we're handling things like the phishing attack that I just mentioned. Cloud-based management, so a really, really simple, scalable way to manage everything that's out there. And a whole new concept called zero trust access, which is an extremely simple but extremely secure mechanism to have your end users accessing SaaS applications without needing a VPN of any kind. So let's talk about Google and Chrome Enterprise specifically, and let's talk about the full stack. And the areas we're going to talk about are, we're going to talk a little bit about Chromebooks. And um, I can share with you that I have been on the team as a product manager uh, on Chrome OS for 10 years, more than 10 years, actually. Um, and I think I'm now the longest running product manager on Chrome OS. So there's a lot that I can give you some interesting insights uh, into how they work and how they operate. The second thing is talk a little bit about the Chrome Enterprise Upgrade, which is the OS Enterprise Upgrade features that are there, as well as the scalable cloud-based fleet management that comes with it. Talk a little bit about Chrome Browser Cloud Management, which is a new offering and really exciting to tell you how that works. And then a new feature we called Beyond Corp Remote Access and what exactly that is and how it can help you. So let's dive in. Let's start with the secure endpoints. This is probably one of the, my favorite things to talk about is how Chrome OS is actually built. Chrome OS was built fundamentally very, very differently. It was actually built from the very beginning. We had the luxury, again, of being um, a late entrant into the OS market. We had the luxury of seeing how all of the other operating systems work and what was so painful about working with them, right? On performance, on security, on managing updates, et cetera. And so every single layer of the stack when we were designing it, we thought of a completely novel way to do it that would ensure tremendous levels of security and make it really, really easy to manage because you don't have to worry about things like antivirus, et cetera. And so we're going to talk about each of these, um, which hopefully will be very exciting. The first thing you should know is that all Chromebooks, regardless of the manufacturer model, and there are dozens and dozens of models out there, come with what we call the Titan C security chip. It's built into the hardware of Chrome OS, and it ensures the integrity of the OS and the firmware. It protects users from brute force attacks. It's the security chip that is at the core of many of the Chrome security features, Chromebook security features. You know, it's very interesting. A lot of people don't know this, but... Every single Chromebook 
from the hardware layer up has a hardware signature that guarantees the authenticity of that device and ensures that all the way up the stack, we have a root of trust that we can believe in going up to ensure that you are running exactly the operating system we want, that you are running um, in an unhacked version. There's no, you're not in developer mode. You haven't done anything like that. That's a very fundamental thing to Chromebooks. And it's very unique um, to be able to have that level of vertical integration all the way down, but at the same time have this tremendous ability to pick from all of the top OEMs that are out there. And you can see that when you think about other types of computers out there, you either have a full vertical stack solution, but only one OEM, or you don't get all that vertical integration all the way down to the hardware la layer, which means predictability in every single Chromebook that you buy. And so we have kind of got the best of both worlds, tremendous variety, tremendous price availability, um, but you've also got this um, phenomenal security guarantee. Also important to note on the Titan C, you, Google keeps it updated ourselves automatically to ensure that you're always protected from even the most recent threats that we're seeing. Another interesting point that I like to bring up is we call it built-in antivirus, but that doesn't mean that there's antivirus software actually running on the device. It means we've made it so that there's no such thing as an executable hacking into the operating system and running malicious things. And there's a variety of reasons for this. From the very beginning, we decided to make, first of all, we made the operating system read-only, which means you cannot modify the operating system. On other operating systems in the past, you probably will know this, some of you that have been around as long as me, that when you installed an application, it became a super user, essentially. It could do all kinds of things. It could change registry settings. In fact, this is why in the old days, it was actually when you uninstalled an app, there were still remnants of the app all around. There's no concept of that on a Chromebook. There's no concept of updating or modifying the OS via an app. It is completely read-only. There's a second thing that we do that is also very interesting, where we do something called sandboxing. And those of you that are in security, you'll know what this means, but it means protecting everything and putting a box around it so that everything has to stay within there. Not only is the entire OS to some degree sandboxed like we talk about, but then every single application is sandboxed. Every The Chrome browser itself is in a sandbox. Every tab within the Chrome browser is in a sandbox. We even have this concept, it was an enormous engineering effort by the security team to do something called site isolation, which takes this notion uh, of sandboxing and takes it one level further to make sure that an untrustworthy website can't get information from other sites. And so sandboxing is very important and it's a concept in security called defense in depth, which many of you will have heard about, which basically means you have to go through a lot of hoops. You would have to break out of the site, out of the tab, out of Chrome, et cetera, to even get there. And then you would still run up against the wall if you can't really modify the operating system. And then there's this other really neat aspect, which is number three on here, that is one of my favorite things, which is we think we're really good at security, right? You can, you can ask security experts about how great Chromebooks are security-wise and why they're loved um, by you know, government entities and all of that all around. But we're not sure of absolutely everything that we could have possibly missed. And so every single time we boot, right, a Chromebook already boots in five, six, seven seconds, right, very, very quickly. We actually spend time in every boot, in those precious seconds that we force ourselves to be really, really fast at, to verify from, again, back from that root of trust that makes sure that every single bit of the operating system is exactly as we intended it. This is a very, very important concept. We were one of the very first to ever do anything like this, like this verified boot. But here's where it gets really interesting. Let's say we find out that something has been tampered with or the operating system isn't exactly what we expect that it should be. We alert the user. We don't boot from that. And we actually keep a clean, pristine, segregated operating system on there. And we will actually boot from that. And the user won't even know. And so what's really neat is by having those two operating systems, you're always ensured to have one clean operating system that you can revert to if necessary. But that also provides another added benefit, which is because you have two operating systems on every Chromebook, if you have modifications like updates that you're getting, right? As you're working, you're happily working, updates are coming down to the operating system. They can happen on the second version and as soon as it's done, whenever you reboot, we will actually jump you to the new operating system so the user doesn't even know. In fact, this is a little, 
a little secret. I love to tell people one of my many little tidbits that a lot of people don't realize. When you sign out of a Chromebook and you get back to the login screen, right? You can do that all the time, sign in as a new user, whatever you want, right? Very, very shareable device. If you have a new, if, if the second version of operating system is actually updated and is ready to go, when you sign out, we'll actually do a fast, silent reboot and bring you back to the login screen. So you'll be back on the login screen thinking nothing has happened, but you're actually running a completely new version of the operating system. If you compare this to other operating systems that you've probably been on where, you know, please go get some coffee and your lunch and we'll talk to you in 25 minutes as we update your operating system, uh, there is none of that here. No downtime. It's a really, really amazing feature, I think. Now let's talk briefly about user protections. There are several different ways that we make sure that we are protecting users on the web, right? There are, we mentioned the phishing attacks, right? The fake coronavirus themed uh, emails that we mentioned earlier. There's also all kinds of new social engineering tactics and they're you know, trying to get access to the type of passwords you might have, et cetera. And a lot of times these are not through any fault of the end user. And there's also this concept of data breaches, which is even if you didn't do anything wrong, you had a great secure password, that place, that third party SaaS provider got hacked and all of the passwords came out. And so these are the types of things that we're gonna talk about protecting against. So phishing and malware protection. There is, Google has something called safe browsing where we literally examine billions of URLs across the web, across the world to check for unsafe websites. This is by far the largest uh, of any kind. In fact, half of the world's online population is protected by safe browsing, believe it or not. This is 4 billion devices a day, which is just staggering when you think about it. Now we do a few things. First of all, if we think that you're about to get to a malicious website, we will alert you and basically effectively stop the user from going there and they'll back out. We do one step further too. We will alert webmasters that their site has been compromised. In fact, we'll notify them through the search console. We will detail steps to recover from an infection and we'll even give them examples of specific code that might've been injected into their site. And now all of that is great, but we went even one step further is we're making this available to the world, right? Google is a very, very open culture. We believe that safe browsing is just something that's very fundamental that the world should have. And so we've made sure that anybody can take advantage of this, um, which I think is really exciting. There's another really cool thing that we have launched recently, and it is called Password Checkup. So if you guys get a chance, Go to passwords.google.com. I'm sure all of you are going now. You can you can wait a few minutes or make a note of it on the paper next to you to go to passwords.google.com and do something called the password checkup, which is really, really neat. We actually will check for all kinds of things like, hey, by the way, you've used your password multiple places. Um, or by the way, the passwords that you have used on this website, know that that website has become compromised. So you may want to change that password right away. This is a, a great example of the types of things that we're trying to do to empower people to make sure that you have um, very, very um, secure passwords at all times, right? As much as we hope that the world is going to move towards two-factor authentication and all those great things, um, this is still, unfortunately, a very big reality of how we get access. Let's talk briefly about cloud-based management. I uh, alluded to that earlier. So... Managing Chromebooks at scale is super important. Um, we have many, many now, probably more than a dozen Chromebook customers that have over 100,000 Chromebooks that they manage entirely through admin.google.com. Most of them have not hired a single additional person. Uh, we have deployments of over 250,000 Chromebooks and they have not they just go in here. It's it's the same if you've got 10, if you've got 50,000, right? Just tremendously scalable. They never need to think about, you know, local servers and syncing databases. And we handle all of that. And I think that's a really, really um, great feature of having that. In addition, you can manage your Chrome browser, how that works, what extensions you want them to have or what extensions you don't want them to have and all of that through exactly the same interface. In fact, when you set that up for the Chrome browser, of course, those automatically take effect on the Chromebook, which is also nice. Those are called user policies, right? So certain groups of users may have certain apps that they want, certain progressive web apps, certain Android apps, et cetera. 
Of course, we're Google, so search is there. So you don't need to go filtering through pages to find it. You can just go up and say, hey, I'm looking for you know a certificate, and it'll jump you right to that section on how to work uh, through all of that. And of course, we have all kinds of really great device reports. You know, What's going on with my OS updates? Is my fleet updated? All of those types of things. There's a lot of good uh, reports for you as well. There's a feature that I worked on. Um, again, one of the benefits of a completely cloud-based scalable system is that with the punch of a button, you can actually completely disable a device, right? So in this remote working world, right, someone says, oh gosh, I'm so sorry, I left my device here or it got lost or it got stolen, my house is broken into. It's not a problem because you can instantly brick the device and you can even put a custom message up saying, hey, please call this if you find this. This has made... Uh, this has been a tremendous theft deterrent, actually, because people know if you steal a Chromebook, you're not actually going to get much value from it. It's not going to be able to be used for anything outside, right? And I think that's actually a really, really good thing. The good news is user data already on a Chromebook is 100% encrypted. There is no option to not have it encrypted. And so you're already much safer just by the fact that you're using a Chromebook. But I, I do like this um, lost and stolen prevention feature. Of course, you can do things like restricting who can log in. Um, you can do, of course, you can have SAML, SSO, you can have two-factor. You can do all of those types of things to make sure that who, who gets even has the ability to get access to the Chromebook. And you can do all of that directly from the uh, admin console as well. Very, very easy. One of the first things that people set up. This is um, a new feature, which is pretty exciting, which is you can now, because people... It used to be you'd restart and reboot your device every morning. I still remember 15 years ago, it might, you know, every night you'd turn it off and then you'd, when you turn it on, you'd go for a nice walk because it would take about 20 minutes to boot. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, what's kind of nice is people are just suspending, right? They're closing the lid. But that means that many people are just running on the same operating system for weeks and some for months. And so now there's a new feature where admins can kind of nudge you and say, hey, by the way, if you reboot, you've got a new update. I mean, the nice thing is it is as simple as that. Literally reboot, six seconds later, you're running on your brand new operating system. But we wanted to make sure that we notified users of this fact that, hey, please reboot. Um, and now you can take it one step further and you can force them to reboot because if there's a really important security fix or something that you really, really want to have them have in 83, you can say, look, you've got seven days or you've got three days or whatever you decide that you must reboot this device. Um, and so you can actually forcibly do that, which I think is kind of cool. Now, all of that great stuff I mentioned, you can also now do from for the Chrome browser, which I think is also really, really exciting, right? So you can manage your entire set of browsers instead of using, you know, registry and ADMX and SCCM and all of that fun, you can actually do this entirely from the cloud. And that gives you a lot of other really cool advantages, right? There's, there's a really neat feature called the password alert feature, which will make sure that if your corporate employee is trying to use that same corporate password elsewhere on some other website, right? They want that to be their password for some third-party SaaS site. SaaS site, we will literally notify the admin and we will notify the end user, hey, you need to uh, change your password, right? That's not allowed. Um, also, you, the other benefit of doing this, you can get all kinds of interesting reports that you couldn't get, right? When you're managing the browser locally. If you do it here, you can get all kinds of reports about the types of extensions that people are using and the applications that they're using. So there's a lot of other cool stuff that you can get. Um, you can manage OS up, uh, browser updates um, as well in a much easier way. So there's a lot of these cool things. Um, so I definitely urge you to try this out. It's called Chrome Browser Cloud Management. Do look this up when you get a chance. And now let's talk briefly about zero trust access and what that means. Zero trust access. So traditionally to get access to websites, there was this concept of we're going to use a VPN. And if you get access to that VPN, you kind of tunnel through and then you kind of get this access to, you know, based on what you're authorized to do, you get access to basically effectively the corporate network. This is ironically, it sounds super secure. Um, it's very difficult to set up and manage, as you know, and it gives a false sense of security. It's not essentially that much more secure. So believe it or not, what Google has been running for a long time now is something we internally have called Beyond Corp, and now we've made it accessible to the world. To get access to everything we need, we actually don't need a VPN, right? So for me to get access to all the most, you know, detailed internal feature requests or roadmaps or whatever I want, there's no such thing as a VPN, right? 
we simply use something called Beyond Corp Remote Access, where basically there's this rules engine that's listening and decides, you know what, is the OS version, is the OS the one that you want? You may say, actually, I only want this to be Chromebooks, or I want to make sure that they're running at least on this version. I want to make sure lock screen is set up. I want to make sure uh, device encryption can you get that for free on Chromebooks? Um, or I don't trust certain IPs in certain countries or whatever you may do. But by doing that, there's this real-time decision that's automatically made. Um, it's entirely cloud-based, which is super cool as well. But you, the end user can be on any network. And that is a really, really powerful thing, right? You're getting more secure by assessing what's really going on at that point but you're essentially saying, I don't trust anything. So I'm going to look at things very differently. I don't trust the network. I don't trust anything that they're going on. I'm just going to make sure that the traffic's encrypted, that the device says it is, the, the authentication, that the user is who they say they are. This is also extremely low TCO, right? You're talking about days to set this up versus months, if any of you have ever set up a VPN. Very, very simple pay-as-you-go pricing as well, which I think is really nice. So do look this up as well. There's a lot been written on this um, very, very exciting area. You can see the link uh, right on the screen. So thinking about the full stack now, what we've covered, we've covered a lot, right? We covered the Chromebooks, why they are kind of um, have a very different way of handling things uh, as far as malware and virus and phishing. The Chrome Enterprise Upgrade, which we showed you, we showed you in the admin console, the types of things that you can do to manage the enterprise level OS features, the enterprise networking features, um, and all of the other modes that are on the device and kiosk managed guest sessions, all of that, who can sign in, shareability. And then we even talked about this beyond Corp Remote Access. In fact, believe it or not, for Chrome OS, you can actually, and, and I really love calling this out, you can say you only want access not just to Chromebooks, but you want access only to Chromebooks where we have verified access, meaning where we are sure that this Chromebook is in a pristine state, right? Every single Chromebook, when they're running version X, are all running exactly the same set of bits. It's a very freeing feeling, right, on a Monday morning to have that. Um, so this combination should be super easy to use, really, really secure, and really easy for your end users. And I think that's what makes this a very compelling uh, package. And lastly, you may want to check out our remote work toolkit at the URL on your screen, goo.gle slash CE remote work toolkit. There's a lot of great information in there and a lot of what we just covered. And lastly, on behalf of the Chrome Enterprise team here at Google, we want to wish you safety and good health in the coming weeks and beyond. Thank you again for joining us today. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Google, for joining us. And uh, to get right back on to uh, schedule, we are just about on. We are going to proceed with, uh, with Dave. Dave, can you hear me? Let's see. Dave, can you uh, speak now? Can't hear you yet. Let's see. Probably helps if I turn. All right. right. There we go. Perfect. How you can tell I'm actually live in person. All right. <laughs> let, there be, let there be sound. Okay. <laughs> All right. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for uh, taking time out of your very busy schedule to be here. I do appreciate it. That's why I'm gl glad to be here in person. And today I'm going to be talking about the flaming sword of justice. And what exactly does that mean? Well, let's get to it. So I have been doing security in one form of another, uh, one form or another for about 25 plus years. And if I'm being, you know, on point with this, I started back in about 1983 when I was duping video games and selling them to other kids in school. So I've been at this a lot longer than I care to admit. I do identify myself as a hacker. And I mean that very much in a good sense, because, you know, the reality here is, you know, the hacker is someone who has an innate curiosity about how things work and how to better secure them. It is the criminals that we have to have the real conversation about. I am uh, myself Canadian, although I have lived in the States for a period of years. I now live in the Toronto area. And I work as a global advisory CISO for Duo Security, which is now part of Cisco Systems. And the as vendories I'm going to get is I'm going to say that our multi-factor authentication product is available on the Cisco website, and I'll skip on from there. To 
a bit of a misstep on our part. Uh, one of the things that we you know, failed to capitalize on was that we had an opportunity that we missed. We had Duo, we had Cisco, we could have had Disco, and you know, full props to Wendy Nather, my boss, for that one. And I think that would have been a lot more fun, but you know, we'll, we'll roll with the Cisco brand. Kidding, of course. Um, so I, our mission is really simple. It's about protecting your mission. And what is zero trust? Like we heard um, the earlier recording talking about what it is, but the reality is, is it's about reducing the risk in your organization. So I can sit here and say, buy the box with the blinky lights, but the reality is it's about reducing risk. And a lot of what you need to get to a zero trust framework, you already have in-house today. You have the ability to go through and look at the users, look at the applications you're using, rationalize all of that, as well as doing network zone segmentation with the devices you have in-house. You can add in things like multi-factor authentication that can help augment that. And you know, if you're using VPN in your organization, so be it. It depends on what your risk appetite is, and you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So whatever makes the most sense for your organization. You want to assume that all networks are hostile and it's not a rip and replace conversation. It really is about using what you have in place now and augmenting it where it is makes the most sense. So if I asked every, uh, every member of this, uh, part uh, sorry, every participant that's here, what is love? I can almost guarantee you I'll get a different answer from every single person. And unfortunately that is really what's happened to zero trust in many ways is that it has gotten confused to such a level that there is that you know discussion. The reality here is it is just what I was saying earlier. It's about reducing risk. It's that simple. Or as I like to say, you know, it's on fire. So everything is on fire. You treat it at that point and move from there. Then you have a good starting point because things are going to happen in ways you never imagined. Uh, I worked at one financial institution years ago where we would constantly go through and manually review code before it's promoted into production. We would test it in, uh, in our dev environment, but not everything worked according to plan. And sometimes things would get promoted and one time it, promoted, it was promoted into production and it didn't work well, which caused a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt and consternation. Security professionals tend to look like this a lot where they are, got their hands over their heads screaming as the train comes towards them, but it doesn't have to be this way. We can do things that'll help democratize security, making it easier for the end users, as well as making them part of the solution. So Zero Trust really got its first um, official legs, I'll say it that way, in around 2003, 2004, when the Jericho Forum put out a paper on deep parameterization. This was really the first stake in the ground, although I have been told that at DEF CON 1, there was a talk similar to this uh, type of topic. Um, to be fair, I have not been able to locate that, and uh, I am part of the DEF CON group, so I will definitely try and find that at some point. But in 2010, John Kinnervog, who was an uh, analyst over at Forrester at the time, coined the term zero trust. And the best thing about this was, no, not the marketing aspect of it. It was that it got people to pay attention. They thought, oh, this is something new and shiny when in reality is just doing a better job with what we already have and then adding in where we need to. And then along came Google, Corp, uh, Google with their Beyond Corp, sorry, in 2014, where they published their um, version of Zero Trust, which uh, was called Beyond Corp. The thing that you have to take into account here is they had a dedicated team and it took them over eight years to deploy this. So when you hear conversations about, you know, just throw a VPN and move on, it may make sense in your organization, but don't be hasty because it took them a very long time to do this. So in 2017, there was a book that was published on O'Reilly called uh, Zero Trust Networks. I don't know the authors, nor do I have any say in the book, but you know, if you want to read more, it is an excellent resource to have a look at because the landscape is shifted. Um, I'm not going to say the new normal. I'm just going to say it's a day that ends in Y. This is how we are dealing with things today. We have remote workforces the world over. And we're dealing with cloud, mobile, and people working literally from anywhere. And we have to be able to enable that multi-cloud access, be it you know, Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, whatever it happens to be, you have to be able to enable that in such a way that makes sense for your organization while limiting risk. You want to be able to enable BYOD because I can guarantee not every organization out there had the uh, assets in hand to be able to send everybody home with a laptop or desktop in order to work from home. In some cases, they had to revert to what I saw in the past was um, BCP and uh, DR uh, report or policies rather that said you know, when, when things go wrong, heck, eh, over to Best Buy and get some laptops. Unfortunately, that literally does not scale. And then we have to move into the idea of talking about breach prevention. And that's at the end of the day what we're really trying to avoid here. 
because we have a fiduciary responsibility to our organizations to make sure that we are doing the best that we can to secure our users, our data, mm -hmm. and our uh, intellectual property. The idea of the traditional perimeter is gone. Um, it's a deprecated notion that actually stretches further back in time than you might imagine. The zero trust approach comes at it from the idea of anywhere an access decision is being made is your perimeter. And we all love our triangles, so instead of a CIA triad, we have the ADU, or whatever variation of that you would like, so of apps, devices, and users. These are the core fundamentals when you're looking at getting into a zero trust program. You wanna make sure that users that are in your organization are the ones that are supposed to be there, <clears throat> not somebody who passed away five years ago and find out their account was used two years ago. Yes, I lived through that at a former organization, not a fun experience, especially that, since that person has super user status. The devices that are in your organization are the ones that are supposed to be there, not somebody that brought in their you know, uh, laptop from home and plugged it in. And the apps that are being used are the ones that are for business, and you want to make sure that your users are the ones that are accessing those applications as opposed to Dave sitting at a Tim Hortons in uh, Toronto, Canada. So it's a really simple way to look at it is you know, from a high level of going through these five steps. You want to confirm those user identities. You want to make sure that you have visibility into what they're doing, what that access is being used for. You want to ensure device security. You know, devices are patched to current or N minus one. They want to be able to enforce contextual access policies so you don't have users that are dedicated to finance that are suddenly doing uh, work on your mainframe on the back end and they're not supposed to be in there and then somebody decides to add in a dollar bang and see what happens. Don't do that. Um, and then finally, we have secure access for all applications. So you want to make sure that you know, your iteration of Salesforce or Azure or Office 365, whatever, is only accessible, or sorry, <clears throat> try that again, only accessible by your staff. One of the lessons I've learned along the way is castles simply don't scale. Now remember I was talking about the traditional perimeter? Well, this is something that we have to address. And we don't want to trust something simply because it's inside our firewall. I had this literally said to me years ago uh, by a CIO said, oh, it's okay, we trust everyone who works here. Turns out that at least two of the people in that organization, we had no basis for trusting them whatsoever, but that's another story down by the riverbank. We want to make sure that while we'd like to be environmentally friendly, that we are not recycling passwords. Um, I know this may sound somewhat trite, but when attackers breach a website, what they like to do is take those usernames and passwords and then reuse them against other sites. And humans being funny little creatures that we are, we have a bad habit of reusing passwords on multiple websites. Why? Because it's easy to remember. Um, I would recommend using password managers or better yet, multi-factor authentication, biometrics, passwordless. There are options out there. Because the password is literally the key under the doormat in front of your house. There is nothing to say that, yes, you are the right person that's supposed to be coming through that front door if I have managed to lift up the mat and found the key. There's a high probability that that will access your house. And when you're doing multi-factor authentication, you have the ability to taunt them and hopefully they will go away. So when I was talking about the castle perimeter and thing like that, here's where it gets to be a bit of a spin. So back uh, in my university days, I was doing a degree in archaeology and classical studies. Um, bet you didn't see that coming. So one of the lessons I learned from that was this, the sack of Rome in 410 AD. And this is where the Visigoths surrounded the city and used their own security defenses against them. So they just sat there and they waited. And eventually the Romans ran out of food and water and they had to fling open the gates and that was the end of the story. So back in 410 AD, it was demonstrably proven that the uh, security perimeter of the way we like to do things now of having, you know, the wall, the moat, and hope for the best is a, you know, demonstrably broken notion. In Canada, we like to do a lot of hiking. So one of the things that we always like to joke about is you always just have to be faster than the hiker behind you in order to make sure you don't get eaten by the bear. However, when you apply that to a computer and security aspect, you realize there are bears everywhere. So you have to do better. It's all about reducing risk. You want to make sure that you're approaching this no matter who, what vendor you're talking to. You know, the blinky lights are not going to save you if they're not done correctly. You want to make sure that you have defined repeatable processes. You want to make sure that you are protecting the right thing. What is it that you're trying to defend in your organization? Something to think about. Now, back in the day, um, <laughs> I worked with a guy that I referred to uh, rather jokingly as the flaming sword of justice. His entire mantra was, how do we get to know? 
it, there was no way of enabling the business. He was a, a terror for want of a better term. And he would run around in my head, at least with a flaming sword and just trying to uh, mete out justice wherever he saw fit. This is unfortunately uh, a shared notion with far too many of my uh, security compatriots in the industry historically. And I think now we are getting much better at this. We are moving away from this to a much better state of mind because data breaches are going to keep happening. We have to make sure that we are doing a better job of helping people understand. Amazon uh, S3 buckets are a great example of this because these are things that can be spun up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a data repository that you can spin up with a credit card and a web browser. And you can put whatever you need in there, uh, Excel files, you can put in images, whatever it happens to be. The problem here is far too often these are set up by people who do not have a security background. And as a result, because nobody took the time to explain it to them, they ignore the warnings on the screen saying, do not make this public. And suddenly all of their data is on the front page of the Washington Post or what have you. Data breaches uh, involving weak credentials and compromised devices happen far too often, as we've seen in the Verizon DBIR and various other publications. We have porous perimeters. No matter how you slice it, there's traffic coming in and out. It has to. That's how we get business done. However, we have to make sure that we're doing a more succinct approach to this to better secure our organizations because our maturity model as to what the perimeter is has to change. We have to evolve. The perimeter, as I said before, is anywhere an access decision is being made. And this is a direct quote from my boss, Wendy Nather, full props. I will steal that line every chance I get. That perimeter has changed. We have remote employees. We have people with personal devices that are doing BYOD programs. We have vendors and contractors that are coming into our network. I've worked in an organization in the past that had a flat network that had roughly 300 third-party providers that had basically unfettered access into the network. That just doesn't fly anymore. There's no reason for it to be like that. We can do better. When you're looking at a zero trust model, you want to focus on the access, the access of the users, the devices, as well as the visibility and policies on the application side is. Back in 2012, I started tracking data breaches. Why? Because apparently I needed a, a hobby at the time. But one of the ones that really stood out to me, and this was in 2012, was a breach at LinkedIn to tune of about six and a half million records. At the time, that was huge news. Nowadays, that wouldn't even get a mention to speak of because we're talking about data breaches with, um, in the order of magnitude of billions of records. And I know what I'm talking about when the data breach front, I've lived through it. One organization I was working at, there was a WordPress install that was up and it was a marketing website and it was supposed to be taken down. We had a conversation with that group and they said, yep, we'll take it down. And to our chagrin, it got popped two weeks later because we didn't follow up with them and close the loop. I don't blame them. I blame myself, and I fell on my sword for this one. Now, four years ago, uh, there's a website called informationisbeautiful.net. They do uh, graphical representations of data breaches, among many other types of things. So if you're a data viz nerd, you'll love this. But this was one example, and I lovingly uh, X'd out all the names. But then we jump for, through time to, oh, right, now. They have actually had to, to repurpose how they display the data on the site because this didn't fit anymore. Go back four years ago, jump forward in time here. They had to change it. That's rather telling. So what's open in the United States? Well, let's have a look. So recently I did a quick snapshot of the number of ports and protocols that were listening in the United States. And at the time it was 182 million. This varies from day to day, obviously, and that's not a bad thing. We need these open in order to get business done. Um, but there will be a subset statistically that are problems. So in that snapshot at that point in time, there was 100, oh, sorry, 1,562 uh, systems that were vulnerable to Eternal Blue, 18,000 plus that were vulnerable to Heartbleed, and that has been around for a very long time now. Blue Keep, 39,000 roughly. These are all things that can be dealt with. We don't want to make the attacker's job any easier than it has to be. We have to take our innate curiosity as security professionals and hackers and apply that to defeat them. Uh, we don't need to make it easier for them. We need to devalue stolen credentials. We don't want to have your password of Fluffy Bunny 123 being used for your internet banking as well as for your AWS or your Amazon account and so on and so forth. We need to take away those low-hanging fruit of these easy things to, that can be patched. 
Uh, and when I say easy, I understand patching is not as simple as just patch it. That never works. But you have to make sure that stuff like Heartbleed is dealt with because that's been around for years now. You want to complicate lateral movement through your organization. Attackers don't need to have an easy go of it. Back in 2003, I had proposed the idea of doing Bastion hosts in the organization I was working for. And this was laptops, desktops, and servers. And I thought, you know what? Let's just Bastion host them and do away with the DMZ. Yeah, so I escaped that meeting with my life, which was wonderful because the admins that would have had to take care of all this were not uh, overly enthusiastic about the idea, so that ended rather quickly. But we got to really approach this from a different way. Well, the way we used to do it was the DMZ was the hard exterior and the internal systems were patched on occasion. This shouldn't be the case. It should be applied across the board. You have to have a uniformity of your policies. And you got to set expectations if you're approaching it from a zero trust perspective. Zero trust is not something you get to an end state and go, check, I'm done. You have to make sure you understand that this is an iterative process that will take time. It's a game of increments. Multi-factor authentication, I like to refer to as the gateway drug to a zero trust program. It is an easier way to get started uh, than some of the other things that we may have heard of in the marketplace. This is a very simple way to reduce risk and get rid of passwords. It can be done. You want to determine the priorities. What is it you're trying to accomplish in your organization? What are you trying to keep safe? These are the things that you have to make sure you have clearly defined before you talk to any vendor. Because attackers can come at you with legitimate credentials. Most reports that I read that people say, oh, it's about you know, 200 days before a data breach is recognized. Just imagine that a data breach was you know, five days, maybe 10 days. If you had legitimate cred credentials in the hands of attackers coming after you, this is a problem. You want to make sure that your devices are, uh, have good hygiene and critical apps are protected. You need to verify your users, verify your devices, and protect every application that you're using. Checking against sources of truth, checking your devices against the device inventory before you get to the applications that are specified as to what you need in order to keep the lights on, it's a good plan. Trust your users, but make sure you know who they are. Stolen credentials. If they pop a website and they have usernames and passwords, if you have multi-factor authentication deployed, if they have that second factor, well, oh wait, they don't. If they have the trusted device, hopefully they don't have that. But the thing is, it's that much more difficult for the attackers. As a result, they'll pivot and go on to another target. But what we should do is share the lessons learned for how we protected our environments so that everyone will be able to get to the same level of protection rather than saying, oh, it's their problem. Trusted devices. Do you have the devices in your inventory that are attaching your network, or you have a BYOD policy that you don't know exists? BYOD is okay as long as you approach it from the right way. If it's just you know anybody can attach to the network, if you're not taking proper security precautions, you could be introducing uh, undue harm into your organization. You want to make sure systems are patched to current or N minus one, and giving you know the end user the ability to patch their own system, not a bad idea. Devices with poor hygiene, you know, BYOD, it'll say you have to be this tall before you can ride the ride, saying your system has to be patched to current or N minus one before you get access to any of this. Every application that you're using in your organization, be it on-prem or in the cloud, you want to make sure that you're marshalling access to them. You want to be able to get granular with your policies. If you have certain uh, geographical locations in the world, you don't want accessing your systems. If you don't want Dave coming at you from a coffee sh shop in Toronto, there, you have that IP address, you'll be able to block it, and so on and so forth. So a zero trust shopping list is something you gotta look at. You wanna have a good asset inventory. You wanna have a solid handle on your user uh, management. You wanna have uniform policies across the board because you don't wanna have a patchwork of different policies that are untenable and uh, you know, difficult to manage. Defined repeatable processes are a wonderful thing because it helps you reduce risk in your organization, and it's something that you can do in-house. You don't need a vendor to come in and do this for you. You can do this yourself today. Once you have all of these different pieces in from multi-factor authentication and so on, all of these things are collecting data. All of these things are looking at ways that your, your devices are being handled and what kind of posture they have. All of that information can feed back into your centralized logging system or whatever it happens to be, and you can look for various types of behaviors and correct them or enhance them depending on what they are. And network zone segmentation is an easy win. I worked at a company years ago with a flat network and 18,000 employees, and I could literally sit at my desk in Toronto and query systems either in Southeast Asia or in Europe, and nobody knew the difference. The authentications must flow. Attackers will look at you from ways you never imagined. They will come at you from all different angles. This is a great example here, a submarine map of cables around the world. 
This is just one of the many, many layers that get to your browser. Um, and all along the way, the attackers are always looking for a new angle on how they can get after you. So remember, we looked at all those different ports that were open. Well, if we look at SSH as an example, there was 8.6 million uh, ports that were listening on SSH at the time. A subset of them were vulnerable. This one here that I pulled out of the pile, I think it was the first or second one that I picked, had 12 or so different vulnerabilities that would have led to root access on that system. You want to encrypt all the things. Make sure you're encrypting your traffic in flight and at rest. There's no reason to be able to give access to people that don't need to be in there. There's a better way forward. We can look at a passwordless future. We can look at it by getting through multi-factor authentication and then reducing our costs by not having to reset passwords for everyone all the time. WebAuthn, one of these days I'll remember to lowercase that N, but W3C published an open standard on w, uh, WebAuthn. This is about using a passwordless approach for web access. This is a great thing to, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, please look this up. It's an open standard, freely available. Read up on it. This is a better way forward for a passwordless future. So quick sum. Assume everything is hostile, establish your trust engine, reduce the attack surface, continuously validate, and keep it as simple as possible. You want to democratize security. Build the inventory, user management, networks. You want to make sure that you have the defined repeatable processes. That sword that I was talking about, that flaming sword is dissolving. We can do better, we can enable the business, and we as security practitioners can move away from that age old version of, oh, you're just a cost center to being an absolute business enabler to help business do a safe and securely. Now, we don't need to throw the holy hand grenade of Antioch anymore, we can do better. Thank you everyone for listening. And through Henry, uh, the password thing lookup was uh, called uh, informationisbeautiful.net. There's a couple of hyphens in there, but if you do a quick search on it, you'll be able to find it. And thank you everyone. If you need to get in touch with me, there's my email as well as my Twitter. And I do appreciate everyone taking the time out of the day to listen. And uh, I know your time is valuable. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, I think we are running right on time, so I think we're good, and you answered that question that just came in. Uh, and as I always like to say, hopefully we will see you live one day and in person. One day soon, I hope. You got it. Thank you so much. We're gonna bring on the Department of Homeland Security's CISA division. Uh, Mike, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, Bradford. Oh, okay. good. And I could hear you, and that's good. And now you've got uh, the slide control, so uh, I will leave our closing remarks to you. And uh, thank you again for uh, your service to our country. And we look forward to your presentation right now. All right, thank you very much, Bradford. And good morning, everyone, if you're on the West Coast or Pacific, and good afternoon if you're anywhere else. Uh, I'm Mike Lepman. I'm the Cybersecurity Advisor in Region 9. Um, there are 22 of us around the country uh, that respond to uh, different parts of the country, different states, and uh, I'll show you a little um, breakdown of the sectors that we go as well. Basically, uh, I've been doing this for about 32 years, or at least working in IT for 32 years. I've been in security probably for the last 22 years. I've been a CISO for two different states, which, um, and I think that span was about 16 years, and which makes me one of three people in the country that can say they were CISO in two different states. So. And yes, I do know the other two people. So with that, anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about today is just who we are, some threats and trends. And I mean, threw in a slide, fittingly, I thought, on teleconference security since here we all are today. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the supply chain. <clears throat> so who is this? So we are the nation's risk managers. Uh, we were formed back in 2018. For those of you that like federal alphabet soup, we're the old MPP. So if, they, if you recognize that. But we are responsible for federal network protection, uh, proactive cyber protection, and we'll get into what that means, uh, infrastructure resilience and field operations and emergency communications. Uh, that we respond to the 16 critical infrastructures as defined by President Bush after 9-11. Uh, as you can see, DHS and CISA play a primary role in the vast majority of these critical infrastructures, and even the ones where we're not listed, like for example, the Department of Energy, um, the energy sector is regulated by the Department of Energy, but CISA assists the Department of Energy with uh, cyber maturity and best practices as well. So we're actually involved in all 16 uh, critical infrastructure. 
Um, Enrique for the FBI talked about the different type of attackers. We look at it from a risk perspective. So what we say, what is our risk landscape? Everything that Enrique talked about is the first two for us, acts of terrorism and, and cyber attacks. And that's all those categories that he talked about. But we also extend that and look at extreme weather. You know, if you are sitting in the Southwest right now, you're looking at maybe 106 or 110 degree heat and how does that affect your business and, and your organization? If you're sitting in the Southeast, uh, your large concern is, is hurricanes and uh, tropical storms. Uh, same with Hawaii um, at this point. Um, we also have pandemics and this is way too close to our heart right now. Who would have thought when we did our pandemic exercises several years ago um, that toilet paper would be the most critical thing we'd be talking about? Um, and now here we all are for the last four and a half months working remote and, and uh, doing something we never expected we'd be doing. And then you look at the last one there, accidental technical failures, you know, bridges collapsing, infrastructure collapsing, those types of things. Um, so what is the risk of that on your business? And you look at it from your supply chain. Um, if you don't have the infrastructure in place, that can affect your supply chain. Uh, we found that out with the pandemic. Um, something as simple as trucking goods from one part of the country to another, if there's no gas stations open or no restaurants or things like that, it, it can cause some uh, pain on the supply chain. Uh, cyberspace is a part of our entire world, whether we like it or not. Um, I Even my kids say, um, you know, I'm not sure if I want to deal with uh, the computers going in the future. At least that's what they used to say. And I just looked at them and went, it doesn't matter what you do in the future. You're going to have to deal with computers. Um, there's been many studies done to say just driving to work from point A to point B, you may encounter 200, as many as 283 different um, systems. And that's everything from traffic signs to um, critical stuff on your phone and in your car, et cetera, um, and when you pull into your building and get to your desk. So how do the bad guys target you? There's this, hopefully there's some things here that you may think about. Um, I think uh, several, Enrique and at least one of the other uh, presenters talked about uh, social networking and how we can get targeted in social networking. And that's, you know, the traditional uh, uh, sites uh, that the bad guys can use to try and get us to click on links and look at pictures. You know, I always say, uh, who cares if the cat is climbing up the Christmas tree? You know, I'm not going to click on that to, to see that because um, there's just too much risk in doing that. Um, but, uh, and there was another conversation, in one of the earlier presentations about how the bad guys will social engineer you and look for your information. You might think, okay, how can they do that? Well, the first place is LinkedIn, and that was mentioned, because there you're talking about what your role is in your organization, um, uh, how critical you are, that type of thing. But also, if I start there, then I know maybe you are in a certain organization. Now I go to media files, and I look to see, are there any pictures of, of you speaking at conferences or speaking at events or or speaking in trade magazines, things like that. So I now know what you look like and what you sound like and kind of how you interact and how you talk. So that gives me an edge if I'm a bad guy. Uh, let's say I go to conferences and I kind of seek you out. And you ever think about all those people that come up to you and shake your hand, maybe one of them might be social engineering you or trying to. Uh, moving on to job postings. Uh, it, this can be used against your, your company. Uh, so if your company is hiring a CISO or hiring a security team or a SOC lead or something like that, that's good for the bad guys to know. That give, that's what we call a professional hint. <laughs> that um, may give them some assistance. Um, online resume. So let's say you post your resume online. You give an example of everywhere you work and, and what you've done and what your expertise is, again, uh, that's another way the bad guys can use that against you to social engineer you. Organizational charts for your organization, they can target specific people. If an organization says they have a VP of security, now suddenly I can start Googling VP of security for ABC Corporation and try and find out who that is and then try and target that organization uh, through trade associations, everything. The other one I'd like is uh, travel. If you ever wonder, you go through an airport, and maybe of you notice that when you go through the airport and you turn your cell phone on, and then maybe 
24 to 48 hours later, you start getting a lot of spam. Um, well, there's a reason for that, because people are can have devices uh, in and around airports that can detect what networks you're looking for, what your cell phone number is, all that kind of stuff. Um, the minute you turn on your wireless or Bluetooth, then people can detect that. And that opens you up for uh, targeting. And then last but not least, there's the old dumpster diving, which I don't know how much of that is done today anymore because all these other things are a lot easier and a lot less messy. So moving on, cybersecurity is critical. Uh, cyber and physical security go hand in hand. Uh, there's a lot of things that maybe we don't think about when we walk into our buildings. Our HVAC systems are tied to our cyber systems in some way or tied to our networks. Our card readers, our security systems are tied. Our elevators communicate out uh, on our networks. So these are all things that are potentially hackable and accessible by the bad guys to get into our network. Uh, we have our automobiles. Um, when I was with a state, um, I, I thought, thank goodness I don't have to worry about the fleet that we run. And then I quickly realized that we started buying smart cars, and, and now suddenly this became a big concern because employees that were driving these cars maybe hooked their phones up or whatever, and now all of a sudden that's a way for the bad guys to uh, potentially access our information. Um, so I was driving the other day, and uh, my car happened to tell me uh, there is a thunderstorm 36 miles from your location. And I'm like, well, good to know, but how did my car know that? <laughs> so that, you know, there's things like that we're just not thinking about because our cars are so tied into our phones now um, that it's amazing uh, the information that it has. Um, our production systems, our robotics are all run um, from a cyber perspective, even though they are a physical um, uh, perspective. They are tied into our cyber systems and can be taken over again by bad guys. And the same with our health system. All the, a lot of the components there run the uh, internet or networks. Um, some of the components that are implanted in our bodies are now communicating with the internet or over networks or in some way and can be accessed by bad guys. So let's look at this whole IT versus operational technology thing. And they're very, very different. And that's why we preach that we have to look them, at them together because a lot of organizations that I visit, the IT people have no idea who the OT people are and vice versa. The OT people maybe know the IT people, but the response is they're those geeks in the other room and they deal with computer junk, you know, and they don't, they don't think of them in that respect. Um, but it, these two groups have to get together and they have to work with each other because there's a lot of differences. And this kind of runs through some of the different differences. Everything as simple as antivirus. In the IT world, we push out antivirus and we put it on all our devices and it's updated on a regular basis. Uh, but in the OT world, that can be very difficult to deploy because that can crash the systems. And these, uh, in the OT side, we're talking about critical systems like you know, minor things like uh, systems that control the doors on prisons, systems that control the doors on, or the, the, uh, the ducts on dams and things like that to release water, you know, the, the electrical grid, minor things like that. So when you make a change, it can be critical. It can cause a life or death situation. Um, the lifeline on IT, if you're holding right now a six-year-old phone, you're kind of considered ancient. And if you've got an eight-year-old phone, it's probably a flip phone and it's time to give it up. Um, but in the OT world, there's devices out there. I visit an organization that had a 30-year-old device. I think it was a laptop, if I remember, and it was running like, I, I think it was XP, it might have been something even worse than that. You know, you, you can have these devices that are, that are 10, 20, 30, 40 years old um, running critical systems, and they're doing that because they just still work and they're expensive to replace. Uh, you got to look at everything from outsourcing. Uh, in IT, we widely use that. It's not really used in OT. It's one guy knows how to do that, and he's done that or she's done that for the last 20 years, um, and that's it. Uh, and then you can go through the rest of this, you know, everything from patching to change management, um, all on the IT side is a regular thing. On the OT side, not, to, not as much. It's critical. Uh, the other one that I like is the, the uh, delays, the time-critical content. In IT, I, can't, I, I can tell you almost every project in IT has. You, you know, some organizations are very good and they stay on track because we're good at fudging our numbers. But 
there's oftentimes delays like uh, our, our push out of multi-factor is going to be delayed by 30 days or something like that. Um, and that's considered normal. But on OT, it could be very critical if something isn't pushed out. Um, and again, it can be a life or death situation. Uh, so here's my teleconference thing, because here we all are. So um, I, I just like to throw out just a couple of things. Use approved tools, understand what you're using, um, understand the pros and cons of those tools. Secure your meetings. So with every technology, there's ways to give everybody control or just give certain people control. And you want to pay attention to where does that make sense or where does that not make sense? If you have a wide open meeting, you probably don't want to give control to everybody and let anybody chat whatever they want. And um, you might find yourself getting weird stuff uh, in your meeting. Uh, and secure your information. So all of the uh, speakers today did a pretty good job. I was on a different presentation a couple weeks ago. Um, and the speakers were saying, yeah, I'm in Texas or I'm in Oklahoma or I'm wherever. Again, giving out information about where you're at, to us, is no big deal. We're just being social. But to the bad guy, you're giving them tips about maybe where you are in the country, who you might work for, what kind of influence you have, those types of things. Uh, just what's ever in your background uh, can give away where you live or what you have access to or stuff like that. So just be aware of that. From a bad guy's perspective, that's what they're looking for. Um, so again, secure yourself. Don't reveal unnecessary information. Consider what's in your surroundings whether it's politically correct or not. Um, some of us in some parts of the country may be doing different things that may not be acceptable to others. Uh, now we got the supply chain. Uh, so CISA is very concerned about the supply chain because many of our organizations today in the critical infrastructure are doing a really good job of protecting yourself. But anybody you're connected to or anybody you work with uh, may not be doing as good a job as you are. So you're only as secure as all the organizations that you're connected to. Because if I can whack somebody that's in your supply chain to get to you, and that's an easier way, that's how I'm going to do it. So there's all kinds of examples of attacks on the supply chain. Uh, Target is probably uh, the most obvious one where they came into the HVAC security, but we have Equifax, Verizon, Paradise Papers, Domino's Pizza. This list goes on and on about how there are supply chain attacks to get to the main company or to get to a different company or to get within the company, like within Target's case. Uh, they came in through the HVAC and then got over in the payment processing system. So in a poll, over 50% of organizations have had a breach that was caused by one of their vendors. And it's not a shock that that spiked uh, in 2018 and beyond. Uh, some of the supply chain threats to think about so your software service providers and outside contractors, how do they access your organization? What are your rules for that? Some of my best practices I've done in the past is nobody got access to the network unless it was set up in advance. So, and my software development teams hated me, but it was, we got the process down where it was smooth and easy, where the vendor had to go through the software development team they had to authorize it. We set up a time. We opened up the connection for a period of time. The, the, the organization had to contact us, say, hey, I'm ready to go in. They did their thing, and then they had to contact us and say, hey, I'm done. And then we closed off the connection. So that we were just trying to control when do people have access and when can changes be made and who's doing that. Mergers and acquisitions, I like to say, whoever you buy, you're buying their lack of security. So you need to be concerned about that. You're buying all their vulnerabilities. Um, physical components, everything has backdoors. Some of them are obvious and published and they're available on the web, others are not. So you have to be concerned about everything you put into your environment. Uh, your network, uh, know where, how things are routed and where it goes to. And then the whole internet of things and IoT devices. What are your users doing and what are they plugging into the walls and accessing onto your network? Because every one of those devices has vulnerabilities and they are now a threat to your network. So here are some of the cybersecurity offerings from CISA, and these are available to all critical infrastructure organizations. And again, that's those 16 critical infrastructure uh, as identified after 9-11. Uh, we have everything in preparedness activities. We have everything from threat indicator sharing, training and awareness, exercises, and a whole slew of cybersecurity evaluations. 
I'll run through those on the next slide specifically. Um, we have response assistance. So if you're being attacked by a bad guy and you're not sure you eradicated them out of your network, we have teams that can come in and, and do hunting and, and determine whether the adversary is still in your network or not. We have malware analysis. So if you have IOCs, you can send them to us, or if you have malware and you want to know what is it trying to do, there is an address that you can send that to at CISA. Uh, yes, they know every email is coming that comes to that box is malicious, so it's all good. Uh, but you can send that malware to us, they'll analyze it, and they'll respond back to you and say basically here's what it was trying to do. Um, we have cybersecurity advisors, so which is my program that I work for. We go around performing assessments on the critical infrastructure. Uh, we have working group collaborations, best practice to uh, both public and private side, and you know, we also do some incident, uh, incident response uh, assistance and coordination. And then we have our protective security advisors, which is everything we do except on the physical side. They perform assessments and, and talk about physical access and physical threats to your organization, including active shooters, bombings, all that kind of stuff. So here's the assessments that we perform, uh, the cyber assessments. Um, the first three cyber, and we go from strategic to technical. The first three, Cyber Resilience Review or CRR, is all about cyber maturity in your organization. The next one, the EDM, is your supply chain. And we take a look at uh, how your supply chain affects your organization. And then the CIS is what I call CRR light. It's a higher looking. Um, the CIS is, is cool because the CRR is a, a moment in time. But with the CIS, I can go in and I can say, well, today I don't have multi-factor. But if I add that, how does that improve my security? And you can, it shows you improvement on the fly. It shows what your projects, your future projects or future strengthening can do to your cybersecurity posture. Those three are all performed by the cybersecurity advisors for your organization. Anything DHS does for you and CISA does for you is at no cost. Um, or at, what I like to say is no additional cost. Uh, when you filed that form in April, assuming you did, uh, you paid for us. So you might as well take advantage of it and utilize it in your organization. We're only there to help you. We're there to work with you on the information that you need to make good decisions moving forward and protect your organization. We are not the experts on your organization. We are just want to assist you with uh, cyber information and cyber risk to help reduce your risk in your organization. Uh, the next one here is the CSET tool. That's a technical tool you can run on your environment. Uh, and it's, again, a point in time saying uh, what your vulnerability situation is. If you do not have a phishing tool, we have a phishing campaign that we run for six weeks against your environment at, at your discretion and your lead. And then we give you the results and say, here's how your organization did. We have a vulnerability scan that we scan your external presence and give that report to you. I like to say that the vulnerability scan is the exact same thing that the Chinese do. The difference is CISA gives you the result, the Chinese don't. And the next one is called Evader. That's that architectural design. That's what the last speaker was talking about. Um, kind of how are your uh, uh, partners connected to your network? Uh, how are you segmenting your network? What are your practices? Those types of things. If nothing else, I like to advocate the coolest thing we offer is something called a Vader, and it's just cool to say I had a Vader performed by CISA on my network. Uh, it's a good talking point. Maybe it's a resume, resume uh, moment. I don't know. Uh, and then the last one there is uh, risk and vulnerability assessment. That's where we have a red team come in and try and whack your network and uh, whack, hack into your systems, pen test your systems. Um, I've been on many of these. So those teams are very, very good. Um, I've had conversations with organizations where they say, yep, I'm pretty confident on my security, and, and the, um, the uh, RVA guy says, okay, I have access to your message board. Would you like me to do something? And he goes, what do you mean you have access to my message board? That's very difficult to get in. And he goes, well, would you like me to put a message up on the board and so you can see for yourself? And he goes, no, 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 I, you know, I trust you. I can see you have access. So, Anyway, these guys are very good and they know how to get in and show you where your vulnerabilities are so that you can proactively fix those before a bad guy um, does something even worse. So here is my information. So first of all, everything I've talked about is available at CISA.gov. Uh, the cyber advisor 
uh, email address. If you want to know who the cybersecurity advisor is for your organization, your region, just email cyber, cyber advisor at hq.dhs.gov. You can email me directly as well. If you happen to be region nine, which is California, Arizona, um, Nevada, and Hawaii and the Pacific uh, uh, organizations, uh, you can email me. I'll point you in the right direction because I obviously know all those. If you want to email me anyway, that's fine. I'll get you to the right cybersecurity advice. So again, we everything we do is at no cost to your organization. Um, we come in to talk about risk and cybersecurity and how you can improve your cybersecurity or, or ways or ideas um, that maybe you can improve your cybersecurity and establish that priority of what should I do first. So with that, Bradford, uh, that completes my presentation and barring any questions, happy to answer. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, I guess uh, you kind of mentioned it before, but uh, a question from Liveleen, uh, how could we access these strategic tools? What, is, what would be the first step for them to, uh, for a business owner to reach out to you? Just go to your website? So if you like to kind of explore on your own, everything's available on our website. And it talks about all the different assessments, what they are, what's available to you. And some of them you can even download and kind of see um, what's the battle rhythm? What, what is, you know, how are they performed? Those types of things. But I'd recommend reaching out and asking for a cybersecurity advisor to come talk to you. And, and that person will go into great detail, everything about these, show you the reports you get, all that kind of stuff. So that's a great question. Great. And I know obviously what you offer with the tools, because I'm very familiar with CISA at this point, it's basically more on the preventative side. Would any of our listeners or subscribers uh, reach out to you in, in case of a breach, or should they just work directly with the FBI or other law enforcement? So that's their choice. Uh, we always are here to help any organization in any way possible. Some organizations have a large force that they don't really need any assistance right. and they don't need us. Others are smaller and they just are looking for other ideas, other eyes on things. Um, other, uh, like I said, we do have hunt teams that can come in and, and take a look and make sure things are, uh, the bad guys are eradicated. Um, we can, ways that we can run through logs. We can give you ideas on how you can improve your security moving forward from this type of event. And probably most importantly, we can use the example that you're going through to alert other industry as to hear our tactics are being used. And we never say, it's ABC Corporation being hit, and here's what happened. We just right. say uh, an organization uh, has been experiencing this type of attack or this type of right. ransom, or whatever. Right. It's that that proactive alert that helps the entire nation. Um, yeah, sir. yeah, definitely. Information sharing is certainly the key. Uh, yes. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as I've said to our previous speakers today, we hope that we go live again, hopefully in 2021, and hopefully you'll join us at one of those events. Absolutely. I'd love to do that. Thank you, Brad. Hey, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And to those people that are still with us, almost 200 of you, uh, thank you for attending. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Our first virtual uh, complete cybersecurity summit will be taking place July 28th uh, with about 25 top experts. Um, and you can visit uh, uh, us at cybersummitusa.com to get those details and to register uh, with complimentary access. Also, for those people that are with us that have a top secret active security clearance uh, and you'd like to uh, interview for hundreds of hot jobs in the Intel, cyber, or defense industry, visit us at techexpousa.com. And I'll put that in the chat so that you have that. And uh, other than that, stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and we will see you hopefully at the virtual cybersecurity summit on the 28th or at the tech expo happening uh, on the 23rd. That's tomorrow. Uh, if you have an active security clearance, thank you again for joining us and all of us here at the cyber summit. Uh, wish you uh, all the best. Thank you again. And I'll put up the job fair right now. So you all have it. TechExpoUSA.com. There you go. Take care folks. Bye-bye.
We created IoT Nation to help professionals like you navigate the IoT space to find the companies, people, use cases, and events that are most relevant for you. On IoT Nation, you can browse over 25,000 IoT-related companies and dive into the details for specific ones. You can also search geographically, zoom into any area of the map, and explore companies in any city. You can find applications in various verticals, such as smart buildings, smart cities, connected mobility, and many more. And you can plan your week and month ahead by searching dozens of online and offline events to find the ones that are most relevant for you. For all Cyber Summit Power Hour attendees, we are offering free use of IoT Nation Pro for 30 days with the code Cyber2020V. If you have any questions, contact us at info at iotnation.com.